thank you everyone for being here. Welcome to this edition of the Verifiability Talk. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Katya Komandatskaya. Uh, she is a professor of uh, verification and AI at Harriet Watt and also a professor of computer science at uh, Southampton. I don't know the exact title, but uh, I, I, I am sure it's in computer science. And she is, uh, she is a very well-renowned um, uh, expert in, in the verification of uh, AI, but in particular neural networks. And that's exactly the topic she'll be talking about uh, today. So Katya, thank you very much for having accepted uh, our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be invited. Um, so let's let's have fun. I hope we'll have fun today. Uh, the slides are not very overloaded, so please interrupt me, ask questions. It's online, so we're missing interaction a little bit. I don't mind you interrupt me at any point of time. Uh, well, I'm still haven't started at uh, at Southampton, so I'm still in uh, in Harriet Watt uh, in the lab for AI and verification. This is uh, my um, very much loved child, this lab laboratory that I created from 2019. And what we wanted to do is to accumulate local expertise in both AI and robotics and then programming languages, verification and logic, because we have a very strong group in problem language and verification, of course, national robotarium. So we wanted to see what's going to happen if we just put people from different domains in one room and let them talk. Uh, and, uh, and many exciting things have happened. So we have about a dozen of people and you see some of the familiar faces, perhaps it's a mix of uh, PhD students, staff, some of them are machine learning people, some programming languages experts. So um, what I was going to talk to you today, it's only three sections today to cover. Uh, I wasn't sure how many people uh, know about neural net verification process, so I wanted to start gently with verification, neural net verification as a domain, an overview of the domain. Uh, and then I was going to go more and more technical, so um, into life cycle of neural net verification and finally giving you a mini tutorial on the programming language vehicle that we are building for neural net verification. So uh, without any further ado, let's start with neural net verification and it's going to be a very gentle introduction. So what are the neural networks? You probably have in mind something along the lines of this picture. You have some signals, in this case it's pixels, it's some digits, but in a pixel form. Then these pixels are transferred into a vector, a numerical vector. Here it's probably floating numbers if it's implemented in Python, but mathematically we may think about reals, and if we verify them perhaps about rationals, we will see different numbers used throughout the talk. But one way or another, it's a numerical vector that fed into this neural network in order to get some classification in one of several classes in this case, uh, we get a classification of five. When you see these arrows in the neural networks, they are weighted connections. So basically any number that this, say, blue top neuron gets, get multiplied by a certain weight, um, and then they go to yellow ones. And when you see several arrows come to a neuron, it's a summation. So the neural network is a pretty simple function. It multiplies um, matrices, um, does addition, and then propagates the signal forwards. Uh, we will not really look into inside of the neural networks today. Uh, most of the time we will say, well, a neural network is a function from vector of reals to vector of reals. So that's probably the last time you're going to see me talking about weights of networks. But I thought it's, it's helpful to still remind everyone that that's what it is. Uh, well, neural networks are ideal for perception tasks. Uh, perceptions in, uh, in this, uh, this commas, inverted commas, because different people think of different things uh, when you say perception tasks. But basically this boils down to, to two main characteristics. They're very good um, if you work with approximate functions. Uh, you cannot get exact solutions, but you are okay with some kind of approximation of the solution. So they're good for that. And they're tolerant to noisy and incomplete data. Again, quite good if you are happy with solutions that, um, that uh, incorporate this as a feature. But of course, um, there are problems. The solutions that they get are not easily conceptualized, and uh, that's a known problem of lack of explainability, and they are prone to a whole new range of safety and security problems, like adversarial attacks, data poisoning, catastrophic forgetting, and many, many others. We'll mainly look at adversarial attacks during the talk. 
So what is an adversarial attack? You have an image of zero, um, and suppose you trained your neural network to classify all digits, and it's almost perfect neural network. And suppose it classifies this uh, zero with 90%, 95% of confidence. Then you apply a little perturbation to your image. In fact, it, the perturbation is so small that as a human, you look at the new symbol on the right and you don't see any difference. But a neural network somehow completely changed its decision and it says, well, no, actually on the left you have a zero, but on the right you have number five. And it gives the confidence uh, assignment to this. And in this case, it's the confidence was 92% it thinks it's number five. So this is a classical example of adversarial attack. And when people first discovered this, they thought, well, this is really bad. Um, someone can attack my neural network and, uh, and I'm going to get very bad uh, classification in some corner cases. So usually when we say attacks, the, we, we mean that perturbation sign perceptible to human eye if it's a computer vision neural network. The bad thing is that attacks transfer from one neural network to another. So if I can attack my neural network, very likely I'll be able to attack yours. So this, this is not good news. And finally, this, uh, these attacks affect any domain where neural networks are applied. So if you use neural nets for natural language processing and control, in any domain, you can always craft examples when suddenly, with just a little bit of change, uh, you, uh, which semantically for you means very little, but for a neural network, it means a huge change. And so that's exactly what people mean when they say adversarial attacks. Um, and we, of course, interested not so much in attacking, but in verifying. So adversarial attacks give rise to verification property, which has several different names, but let's call this epsilon ball robustness. So um, the essence of this verification property is this. I say, well, suppose I have an image in this example, it's just seven, but for any image in my data set, um, I'm saying that I'm defining this epsilon ball, and you can see the definition on the bottom as a set of all points such that these points are within some epsilon distance of my designated uh, image, a designated data set point. And so this gives me an epsilon ball for that chosen x hat. And so the robustness property then is to say that all points within this epsilon ball are classified robustly. And there is a little bit of a deviation in the literature of what robustly means. In the simplest case, you could say all points in my epsilon ball are classified as the same class. But then there is Lipschitz robustness and other forms of robustness when this message could be uh, nuanced. But let's, for simplicity for now, just say classify all points in, um, in epsilon ball robustly means just classify them in the same class. OK, so this was uh, an example how we took some problem from machine learning domain, uh, lack of adversarial robustness, and converted this into a verification property. So this was one of the very first instances when we brought machine learning problem back to logicians domain, to verification domain. And we're gonna see uh, yet another instance. So first iconic example, epsilon ball robustness, and second iconic example. So this is a famous acas XUL verification challenge. Uh, we model a collision avoidance system for unmanned autonomous aircraft. We we'll probably should be thinking about drones or something like this. Um, inputs to the system, and you, you see here two aircraft. So let's, um, let's have a look because we'll use this example later. We have a few parameters as inputs. Distance to intruder, so it's, it's right there between the two ships. Angle to intruder, that's theta here in red. Um, intruder heading, um, pi, let me find pi, oh, it's not in the picture. Speed, own speed, and intruder speed, so two speeds here. And outputs, uh, one of the most important clear of conflict, which you will often see abbreviated as COC in the literature and in these slides. Um, and this is an instruction, that's why it's an um, output. So your system says, fine, clear of conflict, you are free to proceed, or maybe you'll be given instruction, go strong left, go weak left, go weak right, and strong right. So um, when it was brought to the attention of verification community in 2017, the system was actually implemented as two gigabyte lookup table. 
uh, and uh, those who maintained this big table said, well, why wouldn't we replace it with neural network? And that will improve size and latency requirements so would be able to use this neural network on top of very small aircrafts. So um, 10 different, uh, uh, surely enough, neural networks were programmed to, uh, to be tuned to these parameters and give nearly correct um, outputs, instructions. And 10 different properties were specified in total. We will only look at property one throughout the talk, but they all look very, very similar if you look inside of them. And I'll give you a reference if you wanted to check them all. But let's have a look at just property one. Uh, if the intruder is distant and is slightly slower than the own ship, then the score of COC, this conflict, um, clear of conflict advisory, will always be below a certain fixed threshold. So this is an example of a property that we may want to verify if we use neural network to uh, to give instructions to the aircraft in this case. And if we wanted to see how exactly what are the distances uh, that are given in the property, there's the exact specification of the property. So rho is less than some big number, own speed, intruder speed, and then the score of COC is at most 1,500. That was that certain fixed fixed threshold that was given to the team that implemented this verification challenge. Okay, so this uh, concludes my very quick overview of two very iconic verification properties used in neural nets. I want to stop here and see if that's clear, whether we should discuss it. So how is how is the audience feeling? Are there any questions? Uh, could I maybe start with a question? Maybe there are others who want to ask a question. So regarding the epsilon ball, uh, which is uh, very, very uh, kind of intuitive, uh, what guarantees that the classification shouldn't change uh, in, in that epsilon ball? Is, is that a domain expert's judgment that within epsilon ball you shouldn't change the classification? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a very good question, which we're unfortunately not going to discuss in this uh, in this talk. But yes, you're right. Sometimes your two seven, so I don't know seven and some other number, are so close that their epsilon balls actually intersect, and uh, and this property is is incorrect. So uh, yeah, uh, you need machine learning expert to come to you and say, okay, we'll retrain for you in the neural network so that they put the classification boundaries somehow in a more clever way. But yeah, in general, this. If you just blindly state that property, it may not be a good one. You may get. I imagine it's also very model dependent, right? So for for two and seven, even there could be different models in which the, the balls are, are fall apart. It is. Too close to yeah, we'll largely ignore this problem. But yeah, you're you're absolutely correct. You can get wrong with this if you just blindly start uh, using epsilon ball as a uh, approximation for the best verification property uh, that you can get. Thanks, very clear. And Mariam has a question as well. Uh, yes, thank you, Mohamed. Uh, so I, I have a follow-up question to Mohamed's question about the ball. Uh, so what if you um, get one of the other um, uh, um, points in, in the sphere as the, the, uh, the center of the sphere, then you get another sphere that, that has a range that, that goes outside of this. And if you do this for all of the the points within the sphere, then then eventually all of them are classified as the first point. So is that uh, is am I understanding it correctly? Yeah, no, no, it's it's absolutely correct. It's actually good. Maybe it's good that we came up with this problem because this shows us that it's actually quite difficult to model these machine learning. So it's not a problem of the verifier, right? So once I formulated this, I want my verifier just to tell me yes or no. But it's a problem of modeling the machine learning space. As a matter of fact, we will not have time to discuss it, but this is the reference here by my student, myself and the team. We were worried in exactly the same questions that you were, uh, that you asked us, and we wrote this little paper that says, let's look at different robustness properties. Uh, perhaps it shouldn't be classified as within the epsilon ball, it should be the same class. Maybe we should say if it's only an epsilon, modification to the input, there should be only a delta modification to the output and have other nuanced approaches to robustness. You can have more nuanced approaches to robustness and you can also have matching training methods to improve that particular notion of robustness. So 
I probably best refer you all to this paper, which we wrote at the very start when we just started to look into neural net verification, because all these questions do pop up into your head once you start thinking about the epsilon ball properly. So I'm, I'm glad that you asked the question, because other than this discussion, I'm not going to discuss this. But we'll, for now, we will assume that somehow we know that our property is OK. Thanks. Thank you both. Are there any further questions before we move on? I think everything is clear. So Katya, back to you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, keep keep the questions coming. It's wonderful. So more generally, if we wanted to generalize from this experience of see, seeing two verification challenges, uh, we will say that given a function n from vector of real numbers to vector of real numbers, Verification of such functions will boil down to specifying admissible intervals for the function's output given admissible inputs. So we say for this range of inputs, I want to guarantee that the output will be within that range. So all the problems that we're going to consider today will fall into this category. And then, of course, there's a question whether you are correct or incorrect in specification of your intervals for the input and output. So um, when did this all start? Um, well, let's first have a look at this um, period of time between 2011 and 15. Uh, it wasn't yet neural net verification time, but it was pre-verification time. Um, if you can see here, there were some tools that are approximate adversarial, but not yet complete. So um, first, um, Pauline and Tachella proposed some little uh, prototype how to do approximate verification. There was a big leap here in 2013 when machine learning community first realized that there are those adversarial examples and realized how pervasive they are. So particularly this uh, paper by Segedi et, uh, et al. It has many thousands of citations because it was one of those that shouted, wait, something's wrong with machine learning if we can have those examples. Um, and other attacks were suggested. So 2017 was a real breakthrough when the first complete verification tool, Marabu, was suggested by Guy Katz uh, uh, in this paper in 2017. And they were the ones who introduced Acres Xu verification challenge in that paper. Uh, and since then, there were more and more tools available. So now you can see they're complete and then complete. And the robot here, it's, a, it's an Isaac robot because our grant was called Isaac. So the robot here is all in tears because it has no idea how to verify uh, neural networks nonetheless, because now there are so many tools to choose from and no one knows which ones to use. So um, current verification landscape, if we were to simplify it, uh, we would need to say that there's a whole range of domain specific verifiers. So Marabu uh, is based on SMT technology and that that was the one with ACOS XU challenge. There are others like Iran based on abstract interpretation. There are VeriSeq based on in interval arithmetic. Alpha, beta, crown is currently the fastest uh, and the most fashionable. It's based on linear bound propagation. But there are many, many more. There is an international competition um, and international standards for neural net verification, which you can find on, on this web page. So the community is extremely strong and is growing. Throughout the talk, I will mainly use Marabu. Generally, Marabu is our choice for for work with neural net verification because it's complete and its language is quite expressible. And for us, expressible language is very important because some of these tools uh, on the top only work with epsilon ball robustness. And we want more interesting properties than just epsilon balls. And this is that famous paper by Guy Katz that introduced uh, proper trust verifier. All right. So uh, we have, we've covered the general introduction to the domain. So let's think together about um, what we would have liked uh, if we just wanted to verify neural networks of any shape or size. As logicians, of course, we want property. That's our verification property. Think again here, epsilon wall robustness or acos XU properties, but we want some kind of notion of what we think is correct thing to prove about our neural net. Well, usually training is somehow there on the picture because you just simply cannot hope that this property was gathered from data by the neural network. So you need to somehow retrain your neural network to satisfy that property. 
and very often your retraining is based on counterexamples. So maybe I found some point within the epsilon wall that doesn't satisfy the property, and then I add that uh, bad point from epsilon wall and retrain the neural network to avoid it. Uh, so counterexamples feedback to training, and counterexamples are based sometimes on some algorithmic attacks like PGD, FGSM. So you get counterexamples, do retraining, then you hope that if everything went well, your neural network is finally robust or satisfies a equals glue property, whatever property you stated. Then you actually attempt verification if you cannot find any more counterexamples and use your favorite verifier. Again, verification may fail, even if attack didn't find any bad example of verification fails, maybe you'll retrain again. Um, and finally, if that all works out, of course, you want to integrate that into larger property about the system because no one is interested in neural networks on their own. Neural networks usually control some perception components of big systems. And what are the challenges in this picture? The first one you pointed out, two questions from the audience, both actually pointed out to the first challenge. Finding appropriate verification properties is hard. It is a big challenge. Second one, solvers, even if you resolved question one somehow for now, um, there is a question of undecidability of nonlinear real arithmetic, and many neural networks use uh, very interesting functions like sigmoids, uh, softmax, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, scalability is also a problem. So this is on a verifier side. Um, next is uh, on machine learning side is to understand how we integrate property driven training. I told you we need to retrain the neural network so that it satisfies the property. So what's the best way to do it? Next one is on the programming side, how to find the right languages to support these developments. And finally, on the complex system side, how to integrate neural network verification in the complex systems. So each of these five can easily be its own research topic, but unfortunately they're also interconnected, which makes it even harder to resolve them. Um, so how big is this whole problem? Um, well, let's focus on the one that uh, is more dear to my heart. It's on the programming side. So how difficult or easy it is for you to just get any verifier and work with it? So this is a snippet of a code from DL2. So that's the system that would train your neural network to satisfy a property. Um, could you guess the audience what property it specifies here? <laughs> well, you have a hint uh, in on line 145. Well, because it's apps, uh, you might think it's epsilon, so it might be epsilon ball. But really, uh, except for this, you would have a hard time to guess what actually this piece of code does. It doesn't look at all like epsilon ball robustness property. This is a snippet of a Python code that would uh, verify, would train your neural network to have that property. So embedding this into verifier, impossible. So let's have a look at the other one. This is also for training. And this one now uh, embeds ACAS XU challenge. And again, this is very much a bit of Python code that's not compatible with any verifier you know. Uh, well, let's look at the Marabu. So this would be Marabu's code for, uh, for stating ACAS XU property. As you can see here, it's extremely low level. So for each of the properties, you would need to prepare this strange low level vectors. And what's worse, actually, neural network is normalized and your inputs are not normalized. So there is some normalization here on top, which is is done like because people who design it know that it has to be done. But again, no way in the property you have a clue what's going on. Um, and this is what Iran would make out of ACOS GZU challenge. So this piece of code again would not be compatible with any SMT solver. You know, it's it's completely it's just written there for one tool. And finally, VNN Leap, that's the international standard for neural net verification, would have something like this for ACOS GZU, which is better than anything else we've seen, but it's still extremely inconvenient if you were to program this. It's just five inputs and five outputs of a neural network, but if you had pixels, you would have file that lasts uh, many hundreds of lines for every pixel telling you that the pixel should be greater than this or that. So that's 
inconvenient to reason on this level about vectors of real numbers. Uh, so um, what are the problems? Uh, first one is interoperability. The properties that each of these tools specifies are not portable between training, verification between different solvers and, and bits of Python code. Interpretability, code is not easy to understand, which is not a very good thing. And integration. So um, if you write them this way, properties of neural networks cannot be linked to larger control system properties. So it's very difficult to verify large systems having these tools. Well, what we suggest is, uh, is a completely new story. Of course, it's the best uh, uh, the tool that we suggest, of course. Uh, well, here you are. Well, and let's have a, at least have a look at what's the idea behind it. Uh, VCAL is a domain specific functional language for writing high level property specifications for neural networks. So we put this property on the very top and we are writing a tool that would having the property would analyze what the property is about, give informative error messages, and then depending what you want of it, we'll send this property to existing tools, either for training or for counterexample search or verification, or maybe you will do some integration. So we're not implementing any of these four blocks at the bottom. We're merely writing a language that would be correctly um, sent, which, in which specifications will be correctly sent to existing tools. And uh, I will probably pause here for a second because now I, I will just show you the language. We will write ACAS XUL specification together in this uh, language vehicle, and then I will leave you to judge whether we solve the problems that I've just shown you or not. But let's stop and see whether there are any questions. Thanks. Are there any questions? I could ask one till the yeah. first comes. So, so I was surprised to see all these numbers in, in the property. What are they needed for? Because you could generate perhaps these numbers from... Uh, so, for example, in, in testing programs, you typically can write properties from which you can generate, um, generate uh, concrete test cases, unit tests, for example. So I'm surprised why this is not happening here. Yeah, we were surprised too. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, extremely low level. Um, maybe because, because teams that implemented this, they were not thinking in, in terms of programming languages or, or large systems. They were thinking, OK, I just need to implement this bit of Python code to train this neural network. And therefore, just no one thought about better implementation. I don't know. Yeah, Maria. Yeah, thank you, Mohamed. Uh, so, so I'm I'm just uh, asking a question for clarification. Uh, so, your tool is is going to take a property and to translate it to a language that could be input uh, to to any of the tools that are available. Is that is well, that correct? Yeah. Well, our language first of all will um, yeah it it translates the input in a nice uh, domain specific language into Marabu at the moment. That's what we're going to see in the second half of the talk. But we are also writing translation to not quite to DL2 and ST here, but to our own loss functions, our own Python code that would retrain uh, the neural network. And oh, integration uh, yeah. is uh, is another thing that's being developed. So the best, uh, so far best worked out part of vehicle is this line from property to verification, which we're gonna see now in detail. And training is almost there, maybe a few weeks away from the public release. Any other okay, questions? let's let's have a look. Yep. Uh, so now just relax uh, and enjoy. It's going to be a tutorial. It's going to be very easy. And please interrupt me at any moment. So welcome to the vehicle language. Let's start with types. So we're going to build a Kuzu specification in this language, and I'm going to walk you through various features of the language by using that example. As you remember, I told you that a Kuzu networks have um, inputs vectors of real numbers uh, of size 5 and outputs of the same size. Because we're building on, on top of Haskell and its functional language, we do not dare to work with real numbers or floating point numbers. So we're substituting that for rationals. But other than that, we are absolutely faithful. So we say the network will have an input type, and that type is vector of rational numbers of size 5. 
and similarly for output vector. So we're simply declaring new types here using uh, vehicles native type of vectors. And here we are giving just a type of neural network because we're not going to implement neural network within vehicle. We are hoping that there is a Python object somewhere already for us to verify. We are only writing specifications here, not the neural networks. Still, we specify the type, which says the network is called ACOSXU, and it has this type from input vector to output vector, the types that we've just defined. The vector type in vehicle represents a mathematical vector or in programming terms, just a fixed length array. So are we all good? So um, make your acquaintance with types. Um, well, types for values are inferred by vehicles. So, for example, if I wanted to declare number pi, which I will need for equals XU, I simply write pi equals 3.141592. It's a rational number and uh, its type will be inferred. So this is nice. We make sure that it's not a too laborious syntax for you to uh, define all types all the time. Uh, let's have a look at vectors now. So I have already mentioned very briefly in uh, when we had a look at Marable syntax way so that very often some input and output preprocessing is needed when defining a neural net. In case of ACOSXU, you would remember that some of the properties were stated in terms of angles or speed like miles per second, etc. But neural networks need to be normalized because if you just take different entities and feed them as inputs and output as inputs to neural network you get very strange results usually uh, inputs are normalized and so actually the property that you are specifying at the top level is different from the numbers that the neural network getting this is uh, is an instance of problem space versus input space mismatch and it is very common in neural net verification because there is always some preprocessing that's uh, that's being done. However, as a human, you want to reason in terms of the regional space. So being able to reason about problem space alongside with the input space is a feature that distinguishes vehicle from any of the other neural net verifier that we've seen. So let's have a look how it's done. It's hopefully not going to be too difficult. So um, let's do vector normalization. Remember, the normalized vectors will be inputs to the neural networks. So um, for clarity, let's define type synonym for normalized vector and say unnormalized vector is any vector of uh, rational numbers of size 5. Next, we need to define the range of inputs that the network is designed to work over. For that, we again just define a few vectors. We say minimum values should be a vector of 0, so we don't take any negative values at all. And the maximum input values coming from the knowledge of the domain, and you could see here a few numbers. Um, and then we're giving mean scaling values. We're going to be using them for normalization, and you again see a vector here. Apart from just understanding that that's the part of ACOS Google specification, you can see here uh, the vector definitions at work. So there is nothing mysterious here. So hopefully, too much anyone who's uh, worked with. Uh, some programming language before would find it all right as a syntax. Um, just to mention that there is an alternative method to vector definitions, because remember I was critiquing other tools saying, oh, now you need to do things all manually, and if you have uh, several thousand pixels, you'll need to do this manually. Well, if you have regular vectors of some sort, uh, there is a construct for each that will allow you to do the regular patterns. In particular, in our previous slide, minimum input values, we didn't really have to provide them all because they were all zero. So for each i, we'll just run through every vector in vector element and we'll assign certain, well, in this case, certain number to each of them. But you could have a function here that could give you some regular pattern for vector specification. Um, and for each then can be used for other purposes. For example, let's have a look how it does vector indexing. So let's define the normalization function through indexing on the vector uh, elements. And let's have a look. So as always, we must uh, specify the type. The function normalize will take unnormalized input vector and give us the input vector. And let's have a look what it does. 
uh, normalize x, so it will take this x and normalize the vector, and then it will run for each element of that vector and will do the following. So when you see this exclamation mark, it's a lookup. So it will say, well, go and look up the is element of the vector. Then in your vector that was standing for mean scaling values, take that same number, that same element. So say you're looking second element of that vector, this will also be second element of the vector mean scaling values. You subtract them, and then you divide by uh, the element with the same index and the maximum input values. So hopefully as a normalization function, there is nothing particularly uh, uh, mysterious here, but this shows you the syntax at work. And that's our first acquaintance with functions, with proper function definitions. So maybe let's talk a little bit about functions. So generally the syntax for functions in vehicle will, you'll have a name of a function, its type, and then you provide arguments, and then you give an expression that defines uh, that function for you. And functions really make up the backbone of the vehicle language because it is a functional language after all. So let's have a look at a function that's slightly different from others. Um, and well, in which sense is it different? Would the audience tell me? For a change, its output type is no longer a vector, but a bool. So uh, if you're a logician, you might even say, well, I would say it's a predicate rather than a function. But of course, a predicate is just a certain type of a function that has a Boolean as an output. So uh, let's have a look what this predicate is about. Uh, well, it will tell us whether X is a valid input or not. Well, how would it know which element of the vector it will go and check whether that element, and so we again have this lookup in the X, uh, whether it's between minimum and maximum values. And if that is satisfied, then it will return true. And if it's not satisfied, it will return false. Uh, so this is a comparison. This, this interesting sign is just less or equal. Um, and this is our first acquaintance with quantifiers. So before that, we saw for each, and now it is for all. Uh, well, we're quite proud that Vickle can uh, deal with uh, domains which are infinite for, for quantifiers. In this case, it's not infinite, it just indexes uh, over all elements of the vector. But in principle, we can have for all that ranges over infinite domains. And I will stop in three or four slides to show you the example. So now we've seen functions for each, for all. Um, well, let's see, do we have any questions from the audience? There are no raised hands yet. Okay. No, I think we can continue. All right, very good. Then that's an exercise for you. You didn't ask questions, I asked you a question. So let's talk about function composition. Of course, you can compose functions. Um, and this is a first very simple example. Um, this one defines uh, a function that will, well, as you can see, it will take a normalized input vector uh, and will give you the result output vector. So let's try to work out. So what would be the type of normalized X? We have seen it, but just, just to make sure that we see how the composition works. So obviously X will be of type. I think a, a, a vector of size five, was it? Of rational? Oh, yeah. Uh, and the type of normalized X must be what? Because remember, A cos XU, we actually declared it at the very, very start, and its type was from input vectors to output vectors. So from that, we can infer that the type of normalized X should be. Also vectors. Input vector, yeah, because A cos XU will require you to have input vector. So it will be basically normalized vector. OK, so function composition, of course, vehicle will check that all the types match together, that you don't compose something that's not supposed to be composed. Um, just to say the language, of course, has some predefined functions. We've already seen multiplication uh, and some others. Uh, do you want an exercise what it stands for? So what would that stand for? Division uh, and this one. Is it indexing? No. Yeah, the extra lookup. Very good. And this one was? 
less than or equal. Less or equal. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, this is just to say the language, of course, has uh, has quite a few uh, already built-in symbols, so that you don't have to define basic operators on your own. There is a question. Uh huh. Oh, I, I have a question. So I noticed that uh, for less than or equal, you didn't have to um, have a binary uh, uh, split uh, to 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 say x is is less than or equal to this, and x is uh, larger than or equal to. So so uh, in principle, can you have like uh, uh, any number of of uh, things that you want to put? Uh, in that uh, using that relation yeah. just yeah so this this uh how exactly the the vehicle team implemented this i don't know but yeah this is this is all up up to the clever type checking it will infer the fact that you're having here um comparison first between the left and then between the right I very see, clever so type checking that will take care yeah. of the fact that it's sparse correctly it's impressive thank you <laughs> but uh, in this case, credit is not uh, is not mine. I will show you the team of implementers at the very very end. But yeah, the the they have done absolutely amazing job with type checking. Anyways, we are done with the very basic syntax of vehicle. Let's just go and verify a Um For to just make sure that we don't make any errors and that the code is can be well read. Let us call indices in our input and output vectors uh, and use some suggestive names. For example, index zero will be called distance to intruder and index one will be angle to intruder so that our code doesn't contain some indexing into two or indexing number three that's absolutely unmaintainable and unreadable. And the same for output. So uh, our zero index will be clear of conflict, <clears throat> one for week left, two for week right, etc. So that if someone is modifying the text later on, <coughs> apologies, um, this will already verify user's input. OK, so this is a reminder what property one was. I'm probably not going to read it again, but it has to do with the speed of own ship and speed of intruder. And it will give us uh, or not, uh, well, it will give us certain clear of conflict advisory as an output. So we will start with the first side of the implication and say, what does it mean for the intruder to be distant and slower? Okay, so we've already seen functions. So we know that first we need to read the type. It's unnormalized vector in the bool, so it's a predicate. And it says that, well, X satisfies this property, intruder distant and slower, if well, X will be a vector. We know this for sure because we see this lookup, but also we see the type of a vector. So if that part of the vector that uh, describes for this distance to intruder is greater than 55,000 and, and so on, and that part of the vector that describes the speed is, um, is greater than 1,145, and that part of the vector that uh, describes intruder speed is less than or equal than 60, then we could say that this is the property that holds intruder is distant and slower. OK, so this is first part of the implication of property one. Um, and here is an exercise for you. So um, remember I was telling there is input space, there is problem space, and that's the general problem with machine learning. Can you identify whether the specification is written in terms of input space or problem space? So oh, input space, it means that's that's exactly the input that the neural network will take before normalization. And problem space is the space where an engineer who models the system is reasoning. Maria, it's holding hands. Yeah. I, I, I think it's uh, input space because it's unnormalized input vector. Yeah, if but if it's unnormalized, it means it's not for neural net, it's for the human. Oh, I see. So okay. that's why it is a problem space. Thank you. Uh, because but humans don't normalize values, but neural network will need to normalize. OK. Can you spot more predefined functions here? Something that we haven't seen yet. There are two that we haven't seen yet. And one is easy with so less or equal, and now it's greater or equal. And the second one is? It's and? 
and the yeah, boolean and so it's just to point out yeah there are some boolean operations of course also predefined in the language okay are we okay with the first one a definition of what it means for intruder to be distant and slower you'd be very pleased to know that we're just one line away from the full solution so we only need to have the right side of the implication and this is the end of our formalization property one says that for all vectors if that vector is a valid input and intruder is distant or slower as we've just defined then uh, you apply the neural network to normalize the input check that the element of that vector that stands for clear of conflict and that's the first um, element of the vector the number in that first element of the vector should be less or equal than 1500 that's it we finished our implementation of a equals property one um, exercise can you guess the purpose of the syntax at property why i mean Strictly speaking, that's the start of the function definition. Why would I put add property in there? We've already seen this before when we used add network, and now it's add property. Make a wild guess. Maria, I'll give you I some kind of, uh, I'll send you a <laughs> box of chocolates after this talk. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really enjoying this. You said that uh, the network is, is not actually implemented uh, by you, so maybe the property is not implemented either? Is that? It, it's a very good guess. At the neural net, so when you see add, it's usually it means we are interfacing with some other tools, but this is almost the opposite situation. Network wasn't defined, so we were going to import it to the language. And property is defined, we've just defined it, but it will be exported to Marabu, to the verifier. So these points of interface between the vehicle and other tools will, uh, will be signified with this add so that the compiler knows what to do with those bits of code. And the second question, what kind of uh, domain for all ranges over? Is it finite or infinite domain? You said you'll see an infinite one, so I would get this. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't decided to cheat. Yeah, but how do we know? So uh, we know that, for example, X, um, it's a valid input X. It will take uh, the type of this X is unnormalized vector. And we can imagine how many vectors of rational numbers of size five we can have. It's an infinite domain of such vectors. So yeah, yeah, I, I promised you to show some infinite quantifiers, so I had to do uh, that. OK, so well, congratulations. We've finished the specification. Uh, let's just verify this. And I think Mariam has a hand, but may I just let's just verify it and then we have a question. Now I need to run vehicle. I need to ensure only three things. First of all, that I install Marabu that's written by Guy Katz uh, in Israel. So we are not doing this at all. Although we're helping now uh, to improve it, but that's not our tool. It's a third party tool. Uh, I need to uh, actual neural network to be supplied in ONX file. This ONNX format is a known international standard for neural network uh, specification. And you need to install vehicle, of course, because you need to compile the file that we've just written together. But nothing else needs to be done. I am providing this command line, which you see vehicle, and then a few uh, options to this command line. Well, compile and verify just says compile and send it to Marabu. Specification, this acosgzoo.vcl, that's exactly what we've just written together with you. Uh, verify, I chose Marabu. Network, I need to provide where this network is, somewhere on my machine. And the property is property one. This is because my file acosgzoo.vcl actually contains 10 properties. And so here I'm just saying I'm interested in one. Um, and uh, and here you have the output. It's verified. Hooray! Marabu tells us that actually the property holds. And let me have me uh, Mariam's question. Thank you. Uh, so so my question was on the uh, infinite domain X. Uh, so I'm I'm wondering if it's again a problem space because its type is unnormalized vector or. Do you yes. think because it's infinite? Yeah, 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 it's problem space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Okay. 
I'm finishing. I'm not going to walk you through epsilon ball robustness. I included this slide as to say that that's all. If you wanted to specify epsilon ball robustness, this is exactly the file. If you go to vehicle directory and go for examples, nothing else is needed. You see there is definition of type of input, type of output, valid images. And there are other quirks here because you also, unlike ACOS Zoo, you actually have to work with concrete images from the data set. That's why you see this at data set, you're also calling data set this time. So this is the main complication of that specification compared to ACOS Zoo that was holding irrespective of a data set. But other than that, you see that same beautiful syntax just comes together to give you the property of epsilon ball robustness. All right, so um, I think I'm, I'm very worried people are too uh, tired of the syntax. So unless the audience insists to stay on this slide, I think I'll press on. Um, so what we have Just seen with you, check, uh, right? Katia, we have about yeah. eight minutes. Uh, do you think? Yeah, will... finished, yeah. almost done. So we have seen with you this part of vehicle property analysis and verification in Marabu. I will not cover training country example and integration today, but um, I will say that um, vehicle is now growing very, very complex because it needs to get all those uh, training and verification parts. For example, the TensorFlow part here is for, to train. Marabu here is the part we've seen to verify, and also the team is building integration into Agda. I'm leaving a few resources. So the first one is uh, type checking mechanism just published in CPP. The machine learning part of it, how to generate loss functions based on the property is just accepted to LPAR. And others are just um, uh, some links to the GitHub repository, this tutorial and the code you can find, download, that all works. So please do if you're interested. Uh, I want to finish with, uh, with just coming back to this uh, bullet points that we've seen. Really of these challenges, I only showed you this programming part, finding the right languages to support the development of neural net verification. But the team, as you have seen, also works on the machine learning side and on integration of complex systems. Maybe of interest is to look at this picture and to say where this research generally lies. It's on the very intersection between programming languages and logic and the standard machine learning, which I placed here from theory to applications of machine learning. So this is somewhere where this research that you've seen lies to try to leverage advances in programming languages within machine learning domain. And uh, thanks for your attention. And finally, you see the vehicle team is very much in the order of, uh, of their contribution that they place. So Matthew and Dwayna the main uh, masterminds behind vehicle stack checking that we've seen today. Thank you, and I'll take more questions. Thank you very much, Katia, for this very interactive, very informative talk. Um, Marie Farrell has the first uh, question. Please go ahead. Thanks, Katia. Really interesting talk. I, I just have a few questions. I was wondering why you based all of this in Haskell when you have so much input output to other things. Did you find that difficult or was there a particular reason for choosing that language? Well, uh, this was part of, uh, it was probably part of the grant. So we were saying that what can functional programming languages do for neural net verification and we've done it. Also, when um, is uh, really like Haskell, so it's part of it as always, is always often in computer science is up to preference uh, of particular research assistants. But we knew we wanted to try functional language just to see whether actually functional languages can deliver on the promise that they can help to write better specifications generally and why not for neural networks. Okay, and the other question I had was that you focused on robustness properties, but did you look at any other class of properties or you know, are you planning to look at any other class of properties with this approach? We didn't have time to look for our own properties. We mainly looked what's available in the literature and there is very little available in the literature. Machine learning people mainly focus on epsilon ball robustness and there are a few domain specific examples like with ACAS XU. That's why I listed as one of the first pro problems, theoretical problems, is how to even understand what kind of properties we want to verify. What we do hope, though, is that if people are encouraged to write nice specifications like we do in vehicle, they may be encouraged to think about more properties because 
perhaps if you have very clunky language where you have to write very low level specifications, you'll be discouraged to think about more interesting properties. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. The next question is by Michael. Yeah, it was actually quite a similar question. Uh, so thank you for the talk, by the way. Um, and yeah, the question was, so currently I'm seeing that you can um, verify properties for just the neural network in isolation. And I was just wondering if you were to, um, yeah, for example, have a system which in incorporates the neural network. Um, and for example, you might want to check a reachability property that's happening at some time in the future. How yeah. that would kind of work? Would you? Yeah, yeah. So again, the, the team very much uh, is hopeful that people will further use vehicle to to do something else in some other yeah. languages. So this third paper here in Formless uh, last year, I forgot the years, Formless 2022. Um, because of Haskell and Agda, they are very close. So this paper shows an example how you take specification from vehicle and then continue proving something about it I see. Uh, okay. in Agda. But we do hope that maybe more people will adopt it within their systems because many standard provers like I know Event B, etc., are just not written to deal with neural networks. And it would be very handy if vehicle could take that work and then provide an interface to other provers where you can reason about complex systems. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Are there any further questions? I could ask one. Is fairness possibly a property that you could uh, specify in vehicle and then verify here? I think probably. Yeah, I've seen some talks about fairness. We haven't tried, but I'm I'm optimistic we could do it. I, it's I a think, good idea. Yeah, I think some sorts of fairness are best specified in terms of distributions. I don't know whether that's, that's easy to capture here or? Yeah, but I think we could try. We, we should try. It's a good mm -hmm. idea. We haven't tried. And I think it's just because there are other things to, to do. But indeed, I know I, uh, I know that some people are working on this. Yeah. Good. Very good. Uh, actually, we, we have a couple of people in our group who do testing fairness and, and they, they write fairness properties to generate tests. So perhaps there could be some connections. Oh, yeah, would would be very happy to steal. We like stealing properties. <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions before we close this talk? Uh, let's wait for a couple of more seconds. I don't see any hands raised. So let's thank Katya once more for this very interesting talk. Uh, lots of very interesting ideas to follow up on. Thanks again. And we will have another uh, instance of the verifiability talk in two weeks. So please do join us then as well. Thank you.